What a beautiful day it was today, guys. What are we doing? Show number 175, right? <clears throat> yep. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, who we got with us tonight? Mike, Steve, Joshua. Joshua, you're catering Christmas for me. Yes. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> I will have Christmas at the house. That'll be great. All right, guys, we have a lot of neat stuff to talk about tonight. We have Richard running camera. Hey, Richard. How you doing? Hey, Rich. <laughs> Richard, Richard Bianco. Bianca. All right, gentlemen, somebody, we're going to do 175. We're going to have fun tonight. Yes, we, we are. are. We always do. Why is that? Because this is the best hobby in the world, right? With the best people <laughs> in the world. All right, Richard, give us a countdown. Three, two, one. The What's Neat This Week video podcast is supported by enthusiastic model railroaders just like you. <laughs> Further support is provided by Microengineering, keeping you on track with quality products for 55 years. Check out their website at www.microengineering.com. Order from your local dealer or order direct by calling 1-800-462-6975. And by Intermountain Railway Company, where the detail makes the difference. Check out their website at intermountain-railway.com. Additional support is provided by Yelzma Graphics, America's leading distributor of quality railroad art and embroidered clothing since 1985. Check out their website at yelzma.com. Further support is provided by the NCE Corporation, the power of DCC. Visit their website at ncedcc.com. And thank you for supporting the What's Neat This Week podcast. This is the What's Neat This Week, show number 175 for November 6th, 2021. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, the host of the What's Neat show over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine, and I am dig diligently not getting December done. I hope to have it finished after this week. I'm a little bit late, been a lot of stuff going on here in life, but it's going to be a great show. In that show, we've got some amazing stuff in that we are going to see how to paint and build uh, these amazing vehicles that you've seen on my military train in the past. That's going to be a great segment. And I think we've got something on 3D printing coming out on that one as well. Tonight, I've got a lot of great people with me tonight. Some of my favorites, in fact. I'm going to start all the way on this side over here with Stephen Mantia. Hey, Steve. Hello. How are you? It's nice to have you tonight. you got some cool stuff on the table to talk about. Yes, I do. I've got Sugar Fire Joshua Barton. What's up, everybody? <laughs> you always say that, and I love it when you do. <laughs> and on the other side of me, of course, I've got our favorite Mike buddy. Hi, everybody. Hey, Mike. <laughs> We've got some really cool stuff on the table on your end to talk about, too. I'm going to start out by, and this is going to be a sort of a how-to, you might say. I've been working on the shelving down here. I've cleaned all the models that were on the shelves and dusted everything, and in fact, washed all the shelves. Did I say washed? Washed. Yeah, washed all the shelves down here in the basement. And it creates the wonderful background that we've got with all the beautiful models on display. Now, in fact, I built an additional shelf on the very top that we've got more models on, and I've set it up so that there's only three rows of models on each shelf, so I've added 18 more feet of length to what we can display down here. Now, the trick to this was I built these shelves a long time ago when my son was about three years old, and they originally had lighting on them. And what that did was, in the old days, they had the rope light that was incandescent lighting, and it ran all the way the length of all the shelves. So I routed out the house dimensional two by 12 that these shelves are built out of and put up all the light into the shelves so that it would come down and light up the models uh, without being seen, no glare, no direct light onto your eyes. And over the past 18 years, those lights have slowly burned out. So this week I went through and I added brand new LED rope lights to it. I think the brand of, of lights that I put in here is Ulitec lights, something I picked up at Lowe's. I went to the Home Depot and Lowe's and did a lot of research looking for just the right type of lights. And I didn't want those high intensity LED lights, those right. really small ones on strips. <laughs> I wanted something that the shelves were in fact designed for so that it would fit the same way. And all the lights are held up into place with actually one inch drywall screws that simply pinch the lights into the groove so everything's easy to change and, and replace. Now, the 
these rope lights are threaded up, like I said, underneath the shelves, and I'm gonna run some video B-roll of all of this as I describe what I've done putting these lights up. The lights didn't have to be cut. They came in pre-lengths of about 10 feet each, and the run was actually nine and a half feet, which worked out really perfect in that the extra lighting is tucked away behind the shelves, and you can't see it because it's sandwiched into a compartment that's about two to three inches thick and lined with a quarter inch oak plywood, so it's all well hidden. But Mike, go ahead and cut the lights down here, kill these bright lights that we use for the studio, and show everybody what these lights actually look like. Um, this is why I wanted to make the models, instead of four models deep, only three, because then the lighting gives a nice effect all the way around the entire room, and it just came out absolutely dynamite. I would suggest that y'all could do this on your layout or your shelf lighting. In fact, a lot of people already use these types of layout lights on their triple deck and double deck layouts that I've seen in the past, and that works out really well. Go ahead and bring the lights back up, Mike. I also put these lights outside on the deck, the circular <clears throat> garden railroad deck that we all like to hang out on at, after the show. And I put a 50 foot strip of lights outside on that. And originally there were lights on that as well. And again, they burnt out. That deck was built around 2001 and those lights eventually faded and just didn't work anymore. And it's so much better now with the LED lights. It's much brighter. In fact, I'm showing you photographs of the way that looked. Um, absolutely amazing in that when the deck had high gloss polyurethane on it, it actually looked like a pool of water, but it gives again that very nice light that's not directly in your eyes. One additional thing I wanna say about this shelves now, I built an extra level of shelves down here. Now these shelves were originally designed not to hold trains. All of the dimensions and everything that I've got here are in fact one by fours with two and three eighths inch high one by fours that I ripped through the bandsaw and that gives our height between each level of shelving. And these shelves were originally built, I'm gonna run this clip, this will be high eight clip, it'll be a little bit grainy as you look at this. These were built for Johnny Lightning cars and Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars a long time ago because I had quite a collection of those when my son was young. I got a little crazy and got on eBay, <laughs> you might say. And I think I bought like 900 cars. And so I wanted to come up with a shelving way of displaying all of those cars down here in the studio and that's what you're looking at now it was very very nice the way it was laid out and my son could step on a stool and play with the cars pull them down drive them around on the carpet and then put them right back the only difficulty that I found was that it was impossible to dust all of the models all those little bitty cars you know like just like our trains they get that layer of gray on them and it eventually became uh, just un unsustainable right. so that's when I actually found out accidentally that HO scale models fit on these shelves as along with N scale models perfectly and that's why they're designed the way they are so I ran a little bit of b-roll just to show you how to do it I'll show a clip here of me putting the final stained uh, shelving up on the very top row here where we usually had G scale models. Again, I coated this with red oak stain to match the decor of the entire layout room down here, which I really like the way it overall looks. It just flows with color. And then I put four coats of polyurethane, one of my favorite clear coats, on the shelf, and it just looks absolutely fantastic sitting up here the way it is. So I wanted to give a little how-to on this show about how I did that. It's been asked about so many times. How did you guys build the background that you use? How did you build these shelves? What dimension of lumber did you use? And now you've got all the answers and it's just, it came out awesome as you can see. So Mike, you've got some amazing stuff tonight. What have you brought with you? Well, <clears throat> I got uh, two Illinois Central cabooses here. The uh, first one I've already shown, it's Campbell Rice's 3D printed model. And I, I put scale gra draft gear and surgeon couplers on the back of both of these. Because I like to have at least one at the end of my cabooses look as realistic as possible. But this one is a, an old right track kit that I had. And when I built that, it kind of spurred me to build this. But I wanted to make the uh, welded prototype built by Darby Corporation. So I sanded off all the rivets on the uh, right track kit, inscribed weld lines, and then I made new roofs of wow. a sheet to make it... Uh, a Pretty welded amazing. prototype, yeah. So I'm still working on, on this one. I haven't glued the roof on yet because I want to put a, a blinking light in there, but I opened up the door and uh, I don't know, I kind of detailed it out, you know, pretty much. I'm not done with it yet, but um, this one is weathered pretty 
much because it's an Illinois Central Golf, but this one will be weathered a lot more because it's the original Illinois Central paint. So I, I'm going to really weather that one up. So uh, then in front of these is the uh, little Lionel from Lionel Mini Prince. Stray. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We showed him off two shows ago, didn't we? Yes. And uh, I, I've got my model of Lionel, and I thought it would be pretty cool to have the uh, AML Modeler's Life podcast logo on the t-shirt because he always seems to have that on there. So um, uh, I talked to Bernard Helen at uh, Mini Prince, Mini right? Mini Prince, yep. And he sounded like he thought it was a great idea. So he gave me the breakdown of how many of those uh, little Lionels they'd sold and what scales and stuff. And then I contacted William Brillinger at uh, Precision Design up there in Canada. All three of these guys are from Canada. <laughs> but uh, he, he was... Uh, moved enough to uh, donate his time and materials for free to, uh, you know, Lionel's, his little contribution, you know, to Lionel's fund. And so um, we're going to figure out how to get in contact with all the people that bought these and, and make those decals That's free. That's really great. That's awesome. Nice. So anyway. Uh, and speaking of Lionel and Bernard Helen at Mini Prince, uh, we have this picture I want to throw up here. And this is Bernard giving Lionel a check for all of the mini Lionels that have right. been sold. Wow. 2,000. And 2,100, and if Ken would stop moving the phone. <laughs> $2,187.23. That's right. So all the proceeds from everyone who has bought a mini little Lionel, all that goes to uh, Lionel's... Uh, Fund uh, one Princess more year. Margaret, yeah, yeah one yeah. more year. One more year fund, and that goes to the Princess Mary Margaret Hospital <laughs> uh, that he walks to every year since. Mm -hmm. uh, since That's his amazing, Lionel. Yeah, yeah. So, Lionel is just such wanna, an yeah, amazing person. Give, give him a, and, yeah. and everybody who bought one of those mini Lionels. So I know right. mm -hmm. you got we'll, one. We'll I somehow get one. if the people are interested. Whoever bought one of those, I think uh, Bernard is going to send out emails to everybody that bought one of those, and then. Maybe they can send me a self-addressed stamped envelope or something, and then I can mail them out, or, or we'll figure it's out something. It's 2021. I don't think anybody <laughs> does that anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I, I never thought about that. <laughs> He's so amazing what he does for the hobby. I know I've said that before, but it, the fact is it's true. Lionel Strang, thank you so much yes. for what you do for the absolutely. hobby. Every time I say that this is the best hobby in the world with some of the best people in it, you are absolutely included in that statement. Yeah, well, for real, man. <laughs> now, Mike, you've got some amazing freight cars on the table too and i've got some as well why don't you talk yeah. about the first one <coughs> well we were talking about the uh new tangent high cubes a couple weeks ago and ken said he'd like to get a union pacific and i i kind of thought i would too even though i model 1978 that would be pretty rusty so um i went and bought one of those and i, I didn't mention the last week though every one of these models is is a road name specific as far as the underframe the t the type of cushioning they have uh, you know, the grab irons and everything, it's all road name specific wow. to each one. So, so each one of these freight cars are a different type of variation. Right. And it's not just like, we're you know, with different road names on the same car. These are actual models of each road name. Wow. Oh, wow. That is neat. So, uh, that's amazing. Pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. Then you got, what, a Conrail there? David Liebach at Tangent is just an amazing individual, yeah. too. A great contributor to our hobby for what he does for us and that he allows us actually to put his pleasure on our layout and run them. And I picked up some pleasure at Redboard Hobbies uh, two weeks ago, on Friday, in fact. And I wanted to purchase one of the Conrail cars uh, that Tangent makes so I could work it into my CSX train that I actually started modeling back in June because you were the one, Mike, that taught us that the 86 uh, foot long auto part box cars actually run with the auto racks. Right. So I picked, I went up to Mark Twain and picked up a couple of more auto racks. I picked up a CSX, which I absolutely love. And I believe I picked up a Conrail, which I'm now showing you photographs of each one because I did shoot these outside as well. Um, just wanted to treat myself to a little bit of something because I haven't bought any models since back in June. Mm -hmm. But the Conrail is a great addition to the consist of cars. And then I picked up this NS, 
Model. Right. <laughs> he said it right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also road specific in that it's got the cushion under frame and all of the handrails in the appropriate spots. The one thing that these freight cars do have is they've got the channel along the side of the cars, the door track, I guess is what you would call it, right. that the freight car doors would ride on as they roll open and roll closed. That's something that I wanted to try to do to a brass model a long time ago, and it was just almost too difficult. Right. Even with a resistance soldering rig to glue all those small little pieces that would hold the main channel along the side of the freight car. And of course, David Leibach did that with these tangent cars. And that was one of the reasons why I just went crazy and started purchasing these because it had that one detail on it that I couldn't yeah. do myself. Mm -hmm. And again, they look absolutely fantastic. And the whole point of the show is to show you new and amazing products that are out there. And these are all still available. You can check them out on the Tangent website. I think they've also got a really nice Facebook page. Tonight also, we've talked about this and I wanna show these off. We talked about the microengineering towers. And on the last show, we showed the extensions. So you could make these towers five boxes high, which makes for an absolutely amazing structure. I'm probably showing you photographs of one that I built that went on the 2007 Wathers cover a long time ago. Now back to the table here. This is what we showed on the last show was the three box high towers with this, I think it's 150 foot long um, part of the kit. This is the standard microengineering uh, kit that they offer. What we didn't show on the last show and I wanna show this time is the curved section, the curved girders that you can build, mm -hmm. which includes three 50 foot girders and two 30 foot sections, same towers, that fits right in there so that you can make a curved bridge on your layout. And I'm gonna set this up without making a mess. Look at how dynamite this looks. Once you build it, you set it all up and now you can run a train wow. around your curve just like that. Um, absolutely fantastic Man. model for microengineering down in Fenton, Missouri. Is that cool? That is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you can buy the pillars by themselves and then this by themselves, or this and the pillars comes as a kit? I, the way I did it was this was the kit with okay. the two towers. And then this additional uh, piece that you could build, it's simply microengineering curved bridge track with, again, the two 30-foot sections and three 50-foot girders. And that's the beauty of microengineering. They also make the 85-foot girders, which I will show you the picture of this wonderful bridge that I shot outside that's on the layout of my river scene. Mm -hmm. um, just an amazing bridge. In fact, I think that's a brass bridge that I used on that. Who makes that bridge? Can you remember offhand? I am. Um, uh, it wasn't. Um Central Valley, was it? In fact, the Central Valley bridges also fit in the same spot. Mm, um, okay. I can show video of that as well. They all fit together. Um, it was just absolutely amazing the way that bridge looks on this layout. I shot it in outdoor photography, outdoor light, and just it just looks so real with the scale water. The water, it's a video on my website to show you how to make the water at kenpatterson.com. And it's kind of neat. There's no real magic to it. In fact, after that video ran, I know Woodland Scenics came out with a whole system of water using the same type of techniques. And I simply used texture paint to create the wave effect. And of course, my favorite polyurethane. And I colored it the color of water, which what color is water? We've talked about this on a show before and I want to cover this. When you go to the store to buy the blue for your water, and you're looking at prototype photos, the color of water is the deepest shadow. So if there's a shadow on the water, which is usually a very dark blue because it's shadowed, that's what color water is. Because when you take it outside, the actual color of water comes from the sky. It's the reflection of the sky onto the water that actually gives you the color. Unless you're looking straight down from a helicopter and then you can see into the turquoise or the green, the various shades of algae, depending upon what type of water you're building, whether it's ocean water or river water. So there's various techniques and various ways to do that. Um, I've done it all the various types of ways, and it's very effective, again, to use texture paint and polyurethane to give you the ripple reflective effect outside. It just looks absolutely dynamite. So what should I do with these now? I'm gonna lay them down. Yeah. Lay them down. Don't break them. <laughs> Steve, you brought a really cool model tonight. I think you said it's from Menards. Tell us about that. Yes, it's one of Menards' uh, <clears throat> new O-scale buildings. Um, as usual, anytime you go into Menards, you know, you've got to at least find the aisle where the train stuff is and yeah. then stand there looking at everything. And now I really didn't want to buy this, but Glenda was along <laughs> with me and she said, oh, that is very cute. A little trailer, a little, the truck that lights up. And she said, you should buy it. Oh, you oh know, yeah. twist my arm. Right. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and buy she it. She wanted it for the flamingo. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's so, exactly you know, right. I had no idea where I was going to put it yet on the layout, but you know, I, I didn't want to make Glenda 
you know, mad or anything. So mm -hmm. I went ahead and just, you know, you can work decided it to buy it. That's right. So yeah. it works out pretty nice. And it has a place in here for the holes. You can uh, put the little trees in nice. uh, to add a little more to it and that. And again, it's plug and play. It's ready to go. And it's... Uh, it's pretty bright, that's too. Pretty cool. yeah. The whole thing is cast, <laughs> isn't it? This whole yeah. thing is cast. Is this all one piece? It's all is one it? piece. That's, yeah. that's freaking amazing. The only thing is the holes that's here awesome. for the trees. It's huh. very nice. Any of the Menards buildings. Plug and play, and we've ran electric here, so you've got it plugged into 110, so it's got a transformer mm -hmm. that comes got with it. Got my transformer here, ready and to go. you can just build more trees back behind it, a little foam, mm -hmm. yeah, and I mean, it'll, right. it'll blend be right in. Away and, you yeah, know, exactly. Things, yeah. A little escape. Exactly. I have going with it. I have two or three Menards actual HOs. Uh, I have a, a lumber yard that's super detailed mm -hmm. in the lighting, and it's great, you know. And that saves me. I mean, if I was to sit down and build it, yeah, it'd be hours and hours, yeah, you know. And here it was just five minutes to pick it up and stay in line. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, Menards has got a whole entire train department I've seen when I go to their stores mm -hmm. in O scale and I think they've got HO scale products mm -hmm. as well. Yes, they sure mm -hmm. do. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's really neat that a major retail chain like that is right. doing things for our hobby like they are. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've had conversations with them in the past and I've encouraged them, you know, keep on doing what you guys are doing yeah. because you're making it easy in that these kits simply plop into place on the layout and then you've just got to build scenery around it. How great is that for the newbie, the yeah. new person this that's is entering our hobby? Yes, they can see us in a store that's not in a, you know, it's nice to go to a hobby shop, but at least a Menard store that yeah. has a little bit of everything. Yeah. And the, the kids can see it and all the things that way and it's just, Something else to take home and yeah, look right. that way. So that's awesome, guys. So what now, about this, man? Yeah. How about that? That's that is beautiful. Do tell, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to talk about this. You know, I'm a Mopac guy. Yeah. This is a Missouri Pacific <laughs> station from Salina, Kansas. Okay, Missouri Pacific Depot. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, this is from a new company that I've discovered. They reached out to us, and it's called JP3D. Jimmy uh, Pottsburg contacted us and sent us that model. It's all wow. 3D printed, and it's absolutely well designed. In fact, Jimmy's going to come on the show December 4th and share Ooh. some of the other structures that his company is making. This is a new company to our hobby, and this is exciting. And that's what I like about this show is that we can introduce all of our wonderful viewers to new products mm -hmm. that you don't get to really see anywhere else. Yeah. I do know that Spring Creek out in Dead Alert, Nebraska, does stock a lot of his products Ooh. because you know it's it was one way for him to get exposure mm -hmm. now he's creating an internet website as well it's going to be called jp3dmodels.com the website currently is under construction and he's got i think seven different types of models that he's going to offer but let's start with the missouri pacific station here this thing is so well designed in that it's simple two roof sections all one piece beautiful the center roof section and the whole center of the building actually comes apart just like that. Uh -huh. So it's a super simple, well-designed yeah. kit. It would be very easy for anybody to build this. I mean, and think about how um, easy it would be to make an interior for that as well. True that. And I just pulled this it apart. Is, at the yeah. Gauge, right? The yeah. other, other part is the roof. This whole section is one piece. Wow. This is all stonework. Huh. So this is a model that you would color, say yeah, gray, yeah. and then take dry brush highlights of white onto the stone. And then after that, hit it with India ink. So it brings out all the texture detail on the model or hit it with a wash, a wash of oil paint. Weathered. Wash. <laughs> wash. <laughs> wash. I know. I'm from Missouri. <laughs> but I mean, what a simple kit. I mean, yeah. it's literally just six pieces. Plus it comes with all the eaves the smokestacks, and the window, uh, all the window mullions that go inside the kit. Is this O scale or HO? This is HO scale. Wow. And yeah. I'm really impressed with it. Now I'm going to share with you some photographs of a model that Charlie Duckworth had built. Charlie lives here in St. Louis, I believe. Mm -hmm. And this, these are color photographs of a model that he did of the same Selena Depot, and he put it on his layout, and it just looks absolutely dynamite. Wow. Yeah, it sure does. Now we got another really cool thing here. Yeah. Ready for this? We've got an amazing grain elevator, and this building is not scaled down. This is in Belvedere, Nebraska. This is an HO scale grain elevator. The main body of the grain elevator, all the tanks, everything is all one piece, all the con concrete uh, cylinders, that's one piece. The top portion 
as you see, is another piece. It's also just all 3D printed, just the way you see it. It takes an entire week. It takes seven <laughs> days for this model Amazing. to print in the machine. So they start it on Monday, and it's done by Sunday, and it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it also has a center section that we didn't put in it. It's over on the side of the layout that goes in underneath inside the building, and that's where they would dump the grain off the truck and into the structure. It's an absolutely amazing building, absolutely to scale in HO scale. And this building is also going to be available on his website at jp3dmodels.com. And Jimmy, we look forward to having you in St. Louis on the 4th of December to be on the show with us and share with us a lot of the other models. In fact, James Regeer went to the show out in Benton, Kansas and met up with you today. He sent me a whole bunch of pictures of some of your other buildings. And this was called the Mid-Continent Prototype Modelers Meet that they had in Benton, Kansas. James, that's why you're not here tonight, but we're hoping you're having a lot of fun out there, buddy. I'm sure he is. I know. <laughs> we love James Regeer. So with that, guys, what else do we have that we want to talk about tonight? I'm going through my list. Oh, you. Yeah, yeah, I, have I have a train show. I have a train show. Oh, yeah. train show coming up da, <laughs> Steve is holding another train show, and give us the information on that, Steve. It's December 11th of this year at the same place, the 1515 Miller Road in Imperial, uh, Missouri. Uh, the uh, Open from 10, 10 to 3, and uh, same setup as we had it before in May um, to hopefully get the customers to come in. And um, we have, we are, uh, fortunately, most of our vendors have repeated and have tables, and we've been able to fit a few more tables in to gain some more. So we're very, pretty much sold out already. So now it's just wow. we want to make sure we have the customers come and uh, find some more stuff that they can buy because you can never have enough trains. If that's you right. build it, we will go. That's okay. It. That's <laughs> it. We have the show. That's it. Exactly. So now, uh, when was I, the last show that we had that I went to? Because I thoroughly enjoyed going to that. That, that was day. in May. It that was, was in May. Yeah, May, May was a May. very good month for me. That was awesome, and it was nice to go out there to that show. Yes, I'm glad you came and visited the show, and that we're all we're, we will have a show next May, but. Uh, We'll talk about that later on, but we figured we'll get one, one show in before the uh, Christmas holiday and see what people can do. I'll be giving Good. you guys my wish list as soon as the oh, show's that's, over that's, this year. We'll just okay. put it at the door, a wish that's list. Yeah. Here's Joshua's wish list. Here's Ken's wish list. <laughs> Do it that way. So <laughs> That was absolutely awesome. That was a very good time in my life. I enjoyed May and June of this year. Okay, guys. So is there anything else on the table? I do want to throw a pose a question out there to you guys. If you were to build a new layout, and this could be in any scale, I would say N scale and or HO scale, what would be your choice of rail that you would want to use? Now, I don't mean what brand of track, because we already know we've got Wathers and Atlas and Microengineering and Peco and so many different brands out there. But all these brands of track also offer different dimensions of rail height, generally code 55, code 40 for N scale or 55 for N scale, and or in HO scale, we like to use 55, 70, 83, and code 100. Out on the Garden Railroad, I can get crazy and tell you about my 250 rail that I have out there that looks absolutely scale. But if you were building a layout, what would be the primary, let's say in HO scale right now, would you go with code 100 or code 83 or code 55 and tell me why? <laughs> Starting with Mike over here. Well, uh... I, I always used code, code 100 because it was easy to find, you know, at the hobby shop and stuff. And then uh, Dave Davis gave me a bunch of uh, code 83 one time before I built the layout that I have now. <clears throat> and there was such a difference. I, I was really uh, hooked on it now. So the layout that I have now is code 83. And I, I'd even like to go 70 or 55 in some areas. On the know, sidings? But yeah. I, but I, I haven't got that far. But... Uh, you can always tell now, I mean, I don't want it to sound snobbish, but when you look at a picture, you can always tell code 100 rail, it sticks out so so much to me now. Right, it's very um, heavy rail. Uh, so, But the 83 would be my, my minimum. Okay. So, What do you think, Joshua? Now, you've just finished building the layout, or you're oh, actually in the process I, of building the layout. I'm not anywhere near finished, okay. all right? So all my main lines are code 100. Okay. And that's mainly because before I knew enough about railroading and HO, I bought a case of 100. Yeah. So I need to use it somewhere. Right. Uh, my turntables are code 80, 83. Okay. So all of my sidings that go into my engine house and all that stuff, that's all 83. 
Now, since you did that 55 over there, was that 70? The stuff that's really low right. and in the dirt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm doing some of my sidings like that, like they're almost non-existent right. anymore. Uh, some, in some places down the main line. So, yeah. but it's it's hard. You know, there's these converters that convert it to the different sizes. Mm -hmm. So that's really a challenge for me to have all three in the same layout. So. Right. Code 80 through rail became very popular in the 80s. A lot of manufacturers went to that. Prior to that, when we built the Midwest Valley Modelers layout starting in 1988, we went with code 70 rail on that layout and code 55 on some of the sidings. The only difficulty with code 70 rail is if you run some of the European products on your layout, um, the flanges are deeper on a lot of European products and they don't work, they don't play nice with code right. 70. They, the, the flanges usually go rattle, rattle, rattle yeah. across yeah. the top <laughs> of the ties. So in that case, 83 and code 100, if you like models like that, is the best bet. That's why a lot of people use code 100 rail is because it works great with all right. RP, uh, RPM, R, R, RP25 flanges and or the deeper flanges that you find on a lot of the European models. Now on this home layout down here, um, I've actually gone back and forth from code 83 to code 70, depending upon which module that I built. The modules that I shoot outside, I like to use code 70 on. The modules inside for just running, I put 83 on. Now how do you do that? Microengineering offers a rail joiner, and in fact it's plastic, that you can have the code 83 and the code 70 rail together and the rail joiner's designed so that the top of the rail is level. Mm -hmm. I've found that if you use N-Scale Atlas rail joiners on your layout, and you want to go from 70 to 83, it's very easy to do with a needle, pair of needle nose pliers. You simply get the pliers in there, and you, you adjust. You get the pliers underneath the, t underneath the rail, on top of the rail, and adjust it mm -hmm. so that the rail height is smooth, and then you hit it with solder. Once you solder that, it doesn't move. You've got a perfectly flush top, mm -hmm. so you can yeah. actually go from code 70 to 83 without any problems at all. It works, and that's how I've done it on this layout. Uh, for the sidings on this layout, I do like code 55. Joshua was, was just describing the section of track. I think that we ran in the December What's Neat video or January last year, where I showed track absolutely buried in the dirt with all the static grass in between the ties. I love modeling like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. It just makes, you only see the rails. Right. It just looks fantastic. Y yeah. That was code 55 rail. As you saw Angela Sutton on the show that we had just two or three weeks ago with Jennifer Kirk, Angela used code 55 rail on her layout, and I believe she said she used some code 40. That's wow. very popular among end scalers out there because code 40 rail and end scale looks dynamite as well. Mm -hmm. Doesn't she hand lay her track too? She does. End scale. She uses PC ties, um, and it, it just looks fantastic. I think she said she uses a fast track system mm -hmm. and all the jigs that help along with that. But yeah, Angela was Still, a fantastic guest, and her, her stuff looks that's great. That's admirable. That's what Austin's doing this weekend, too, is handling <laughs> his turnouts, remember? So mm. we'll have to check in with him here soon and see how those turned <laughs> out. <it> Austin. <laughs> We're missing Austin. We're missing Campbell Wright and James Regeer tonight, but we still have a lot of great people. Thank you so much, Richard, for running camera tonight. I think we're going to go out and play some pool after this, aren't we? That sounds good. I know, rock and roll. Before we do that, we're going to take our NCE power cap system, and we're going to run some trains on this layout on the 83 and 70 rail that we just described, and I want to put these new tangent cars on and see how well they track. I'm sure they track great. Yes. Yeah. So with that, guys, great group of people. First week of November. That's right. Looking forward to the last part of 2021, guys. This is the best hobby in the world with some of the best people in it us and the viewers just like you. And with that, guys, let's go run some trains. See you later. That was great. Yeah, it was, <laughs> man. Nice show. Yeah, yes. very smooth. Wow. Thumbnail real fun? quick, just everybody smile and wave. Okay. All right, guys, everybody, let's show them some teeth. Let's give them a thumbs up and smile for our thumbnail tonight. <laughs> Just like that, keep the main camera running. I'll kill sound. And we get to run some trains for real now. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. That military train's looking real nice over there. I don't know if I've ever done that. Isn't it wonderful? It's a work in progress. Yes, it works and everything's working.